what's up? Fortunately for you guys, I've spent the last week making pretty much every possible cheesecake related mistake. I burnt some, I undercooked some, I cracked like three or four in a row, and somehow I got two cheesecakes completely waterlogged. All of that pain though has produced some great results, and now I've got a recipe that's super simple, easy to produce, and so much better than something that you can buy. To get started, I'm gonna grab my food processor. Into the bowl of that, I'll measure three eight packs of graham crackers, or about 375 grams. If you wanted to sub in another pleasureless cookie cracker type thing, I'd say vanilla wafer or animal crackers would also work well. Next thing is 110 grams of walnuts. I gave these ones a light toasting in a medium heat oven for about 15 minutes, but you could skip these if you were willing to sacrifice some nuttiness. I'm not. Behind nuts comes 40 grams of sugar, three grams of salt, and now to bring a little bit more rigidity and structure to this otherwise very crumbly crust, I'm gonna add in 30 grams of all-purpose flour. Now I'll spin everything up until it's well broken down because overly coarse crumbs lead to a mixture that's very difficult to compress into a proper crust. Once the crackers and nuts are broken down into a sandy texture like this, I'll grab 170 grams or about a stick and a half of melted butter, and then I'll slowly drizzle that into the food processor while it's spinning. Once all the butter is in, I'll come back and stir and scrape to get things more evenly combined. The butter tends to set on the bottom of the food processor and the crumbs on top don't get as saturated this way. So I'll pulse this one more time after scraping and stirring things together and there we go. Now to verify this is useful crust dust, I'll give it a hard squeeze to see if it can be compressed fully. And this looks good, but if yours crumbles apart instead, add more butter. Now to shape this into a usable crust, I'll grab my nine inch spring form pan. And by the way, this vessel is non-negotiable in my mind because without a spring form, getting clean slices of cheesecake is gonna be nearly impossible. Now, now, I'm gonna lay in a round of parchment paper next. That's mainly to keep the spring form from getting scratched when I cut the cake, and then I'll butter or pan spray the inside as a caution against sticking. Now, I'm gonna layer in just over half of my graham crackers. You can eyeball it, I'd say about 60% needs to go into the pan. You'll see what the other 40% is for in just a second. Next, I'm gonna grab a flat bottom glass, specifically one that has nice straight sides like this. The right angle on the bottom of a glass like this is ideal for pressing a clean interior edge into a two-sided crust. To do that, I'll push this glass into the crumbs until I've reached the parchment paper. And then I'll work to spread that crackery sand all the way to the sides of the pan as evenly as I can. Once I got a rough ring of crumbs pushed against the side, I'll start to press that firmly into the side of the pan all the way around. This sideward pressure of the glass is gonna push the crumbs up the side towards the edge and eventually it'll hit the top. Once it's up there, I like to use my thumb to press downwards on the edge to get it even more compressed. Once I've got the crust pushed into a very tight, tall ring with an even firm edge all the way around the top, I'm gonna drop the the other 40% of the crumbs into the pan. Behind that, I'll spread the crumbs evenly from edge to edge with a spoon, and depth-wise here before mashing it down, I'd say I'm just above half of an inch. This stuff should compress by just about half. Then I'll come back with my glass to press those crumbs down while also reinforcing the sides. If you wanted to skip the extra work of doing a two-sided crust like I am, you could just have the crust recipe and make a bottom-only cheesecake. I've done that before, and it's cool, but aesthetically, the double crust looks amazing and it provides about double the amount of crust. Now, to avoid a common pitfall with cheesecake crusts, I'm gonna par-bake this one before we add the filling. If we skip this step, the moisture from the custard would never allow the crust to dehydrate and get fully crisp. This goes into my 350F 175C oven to bake for 10 minutes. While this bakes, I'm gonna get my cream cheese custard sorted out. For that, I'll grab my stand mixer and in the bowl of that, add 900 grams or four blocks of room temperature cream cheese. And I mean it on the temperature too. This stuff needs to be aggressively room temp. Otherwise, it really can't be mixed into a creamy, lumpless custard. Next in is my secret ingredient to take this cake pro, and that's eight ounces or 225 grams of goat's cheese. Sub in cream cheese if you're not a goat girl like me. Next, I'll add in 240 grams of sugar. Yes, that's quite a bit less than most recipes that I've seen online, but less sugar allows us to perceive more of the natural acidity from the cream and goat cheeses. Then in goes five grams of salt and then 30 grams of cornstarch. The cornstarch helps make a more stable custard that is less likely to crack, theoretically. Now the paddle attachment goes on and I'll spin this cheese together on medium speed. After 30 seconds of spinning, I'm gonna come back and scrape down the sides. This step is very important because we want the cheese custard to be as homogenous as humanly possible, and the sides of the bowl love to keep things from mixing together. Okay, I'll spin that for about one more minute, and my crust timer's going off, so I'll head back to the oven, and I'll pull that out so we can get it cooling down. And man, I'm really excited about this form factor. There's gonna be so much crust per bite, it's gonna be sick. Back at the mixer, once the goat and cream cheeses are well combined and creamed up with the sugar and starch, I'm gonna add 125 grams of sour cream, 
the zest of a whole lemon. I just hit that with my microplane to zest it, and then I ran my knife through it so the zest wouldn't stand out texturally in the final cake. The added acidity from the sour cream and the fresh citrusy aroma here really wake up the flavors in that cream cheese. Behind the zest comes five grams of vanilla extract, and then the paddle attachment goes back on, and I'll mix this together for about another minute or so. Before I add what's next, I'm gonna give the paddle itself and the sides of the bowl one more scrape down, and then I'll grab five large eggs and two egg yolks. Now, with the mixer spinning on medium speed, I'm gonna drizzle in one egg at a time. I'll let that first one get fully incorporated and then I'll drop in the next one. I'll mention that now that we have egg whites in the bowl, we need to be really careful about how much we mix this. Those eggs are gonna wanna trap air into the custard and that's not ideal for cheesecake. More air means more souffleing in the oven and that higher rise means a higher chance of collapse and eventually crackage. Once all these eggs are in, I'm gonna spin for no longer than is necessary to fully combine everything. I didn't film this step, but make sure to scrape this down at least one more time. When finished, we should have a very silky, creamy, 100% homogenous custard, and that looks perfect. Now, I'm gonna drizzle this into my fully cooled two-sided crust. Again, if you wanted to go single crust, go wild, just make a half batch of the crumbs and a full batch of the custard. Now, this custard should fill the shell just about all the way to the top, and once it's fully loaded, I'm gonna load this cake into my oven to bake at 325F, 160C for one full hour. After one hour of baking at 325F, I'll come back and check the doneness of this cheesecake. When I give it a little shake like this, you can see that the middle is just a little bit soft and a little bit jiggly, maybe four inches across. For now, I'm going to close my oven door and turn off the oven and let this cake coast and cool down for another 45 minutes. If you're wondering, hey, Bri, what about a water bath? A lot of people say that that's the only way to keep a cheesecake from cracking. Well, I tried that two different times and the result was cracked, like really deeply cracked. I tried to cook one less, I tried to cook one more, both in a water bath and both cracked. I know, it's weird, but in my house, a water bath just does not provide the proper results. So I don't endorse it, it's added complexity, and I really don't think you need to do it, especially if you're doing a two-sided crust. That extra layer of graham crackers insulates the custard and helps prevent large temperature swings once it's baked. The large shift in temperature is actually what mainly causes cracking in cheesecakes. So that's why we leave the cake in the oven to slowly set up and cool gently. After one hour of baking and 45 minutes of door closed cool down time, this cheesecake is ready to pull out. From here, I'm gonna let the cake fully chill to room temperature and then I'll eventually move it to the fridge tented with foil. This cheesecake needs at least 10 hours before you wanna eat it, preferably like 24. It takes a really long time to become cuttable. So while that cools, I'm gonna quickly make the fruit topping for this cake. For me, the absolute classic and only choice is cherries. I'm not a huge fan of the syrupy stuff that you can get canned at the grocery store, so I'm gonna make my own version and it only takes about 10 minutes. To do that, I'm gonna start with 12 ounces or about 350 grams of frozen dark cherries. These are a huge asset in my opinion. I didn't know that you could buy frozen dark cherries until recently, but they're pre-pitted, unsweetened, and ready to rip. Now into a 10 inch nonstick pan, I'm gonna add all of my cherries, again about 350 grams, and then a strong pinch of salt, 150 grams of sugar, and then I'll grab a whole lemon. I'll rip off its zest just like I did for my cheesecake, and then I'll juice both halves and, and that goes. Once everything's combined, I'll move this pan over to the stove and drop it down over high heat. Since there's so much moisture in this pan, we don't have to worry about the 500F speed limit on nonstick pans, the natural evap here is going to keep the temperature well in the low 300s. Once everything's stirred up, I'll boil this hard for five to six minutes or until the sugar turns to syrup and reduces to the point that it's bubbling huge like this. If we cooked this beyond five to six minutes, the sugar temperature would start to rise pretty rapidly and eventually become caramel. Right now, we're looking to go well below the softball candy stage of sugar. The temperature here is between 223 and 226. That's going to be the perfect temperature for a dark, gooey, fresh taste tasting cherry sauce. Now I'll take this off the heat and move it over to a bowl to cool it down. Disclaimer, don't get this stuff on your skin because hot sugar stores heat way more effectively than hot water and it will stay hot on your skin for way longer. I once spilled an entire gallon of boiling syrup on my feet at the restaurant and I was super bummed when all of the skin came off of my feet. Once this is slightly cooled, I'm gonna move it over to the fridge to fully cool for at least two hours. The next day, it's time to check back on our cheesecake and cherry sauce. As you can see, overnight the cherries have set up into a gooey sauce that's thick but not gloppy, and it's gonna bring the perfect amount of tart, fruity contrast to the rich, creamy cake. The cake itself is fully set up in the middle. If it was under bake, you'd be able to put your finger through it and it would be more pudding-like. This feels great. Now to serve, I'm gonna gently release the spring form and then use a cake spatula or something like it to carefully go around the outside to make sure nothing is stuck. I'll lift the form and wow. 
That is a regal looking cake made of cheese. The crust is perfectly set and the edges, well, they're as nice and clean as a crumbly graham cracker crust would potentially allow. To cut this, I'll grab a high sided container filled with warm water and then I'll dip a heavy handled chef's knife into that. For whatever reason, my usual thin boning knife that I like to use for cake just doesn't cut through cheesy custard as well. And the wet heavy blade here really helps that knife get through the thick brittle bottom crust with authority. I'll dip the blade in between slices to keep the piece from getting crumb covered and smeared up. And once I've got a perfect clean little slice of cheesecake, I'm gonna lay it down on a plate and then top it with some stewed tart cherries and their bright lemony fruit sauce. And uh, yeah, that looks pretty dope. Not only does this two-sided crust provide a lot more crunch per slice, but it also makes this cake aesthetically really beautiful. Flavor-wise, the crust is toasty, crispy, nutty, and salty. The cheese custard is super light, but unbelievably decadent and strikes a super clean balance between sugar and acidity. Like I said, there's a lot of really good over-the-counter cheesecakes out there, and I set out to make something special, and I really think this is. I hope you try it soon. Let's eat this thing. 